Welcome to you, our audience, at this very special online event with Rebecca Henderson, <clears throat> professor at the Harvard Business School. And welcome, Professor Henderson, joining us from Cambridge. Her book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, was published in Dutch by Business Contacts as A New Kapitalisme for een Wereld in Verwarding. Verwarding, confusion, it does sound a little bit less dramatic than on fire, doesn't it? Rebecca Henderson argues in this book that only a new form of capitalism can drive the innovation we need to build a just and sustainable world and to help solve the three great problems of our time, climate change, inequality, and threats to democracy. In the book, she says, and it is her true conviction, business can change the world. Well, we have a lot to talk about. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, whose mission is to bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands. We have partnered this evening with two of our corporate members, the Amsterdam Business School at the University of Amsterdam and Limes International, which offers worldwide tax, legal, and mobility services. ABS and Limes support us because they are interested not only in ideas from the US, but in what is going on in the world in general. A new take on capitalism is one of those big ideas. And we from the John Adams are delighted to bring our sponsors together to benefit from each other. Limes is a dynamic firm always on the lookout for new talent. And ABS is always on the lookout for future opportunities for their students. Mobility services. This event is the first in the ABS new sustainability speaker series. We have two moderators this evening. Let me introduce them to you. This is Julia Schubert from Poland, a master's student in international business here at the Amsterdam Business School and an honors student in sustainability. The honors class has been reading and discussing Henderson's book together with Professor Michelle Westermann. Julia will pose questions of her own and on behalf of her classmates. We also have with us Rick van der Ploeg. Welcome, Rick. Is a renowned economist and former Dutch Labour Party politician. He is a professor both at the University of Oxford and now here in Amsterdam. Here we have another first. This is Rick van der Ploeg's first public appearance in his new capacity as a university professor at the University of Amsterdam. And so if you're wondering why I'm here, I am here to take your questions for those of you who have joined us on Zoom. So don't let me down. Make sure to send your questions in via the chat at the bottom of your screen. At the end of our talk, I will also return with a couple closing remarks. Just one more particularity. Because of the curfew, we decided to start 15 minutes earlier than was originally announced. If you miss the first 15 minutes, and I will repeat this also later in our evening together, do not despair. You can watch the complete event again on our website, www.john-adams.nl. I am honored to now give the floor to Rick, who, as an economist, will introduce Henderson's work and share some of his own thoughts. After that, Professor Henderson, Rebecca, herself will tell us about what drove her to write this book and the convictions that she has developed while doing so. Then Julia will kick off the conversation with questions from herself and from the students. Rick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Tracy and I go back uh, more than 20 years, because when I was a politician, you were uh, an important advisor and contributed to the debate on architecture. Reporter, reporter. Reporter. But you but make also it sound like we had an affair, which we no, didn't. No, well, no, but I learned a lot from you at that time. <laughs> it's my job here to introduce uh, Rebecca and to say a few words about it. I, I'm not sure you're always billed as being American, but is it, but, but I think you're a bit British, aren't you? Or, or, and so, so let's, let's make that clear. So it's a Britain America we have. And she's uh, uh, one of only a very few uh, university professors in Harvard. So she's not just an ordinary professor. She's a university professor. Very popular, but she's won many, many teaching prizes. She's uh, both a, a good economist and a, and, 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 and a very important uh, management practitioner where she studied management practices. 
the work I know best of you, Rebecca, is on innovation and patents. Uh, but I've also read your work in the American Economic Review on, on climate change, and you're pleased there, which already a precursor to what's in your book. And of course, you've done a lot of work also on the cultural boardrooms, uh, maybe call it corporate governance, which is actually, uh, I'm sure it's going to feature in the discussions we have when we discuss your book as well. Now, your book is. Uh, is a is a, is a, is, a, is a, won all kinds of prizes, uh, particularly the Financial Times McKinsey Award, the 2020 Award for the Business Book of the Year. It's, it's not just something. So, and, and in the past, you you become used to getting prizes, so we won't talk too much about it. So the book is re reimagining capitalism in the world of fire. So 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 let's look at the world. So we, a few years ago, we had quite a few years ago, we had about about 14 years ago, we had the uh, the um, uh, review the, the, uh, around by Lord Stern on, on climate change, and and we're talking 14 years later, emissions are still going up. Uh, we still have uh, lots of steel factories, cement, and lots of other things. Uh, uh, Rebecca is very interested in it. Uh, other people like Bill Gates have just put out a book on that as well, and also asking for a big role for businesses and technology, which is just right there with your type of work. And and uh, only a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, Sir Parfidus Gupta uh, put out the biodiversity review. And again, that's a very tragic story. So we really have a, a tragic of the commons that we see that the biodiversity on the planet is getting worse and worse and worse. We, uh, the climate is getting worse. Our natural stock of natural resources, our capital, our natural capital is being depleted very quickly. Uh, we see also a scramble for natural resources. Uh, often in the poorest country of the planet, like often in Africa, where we need those, those resources. And so, so that's the big thing, uh, the climate, biodiversity, the environment. The second big problem that we are going to discuss today, uh, uh, which is features you know, strongly in Rebecca's book, is in inequality. We only have to look at the pandemic, that the pandemic was a hugely unequal uh, 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 event. I mean, it was the poorest people uh, black people, uh, but also people who were in the, maybe in the, the more rotten jobs, uh, so, so not the university professors, who were more vulnerable to get, uh, get COVID-19. And we see, of course, also the scramble for the rich countries, almost embarrassing to get our, uh, our, our, our vaccines sorted out. And, and yet we're not worrying about vaccines in the rest of the world. And then there are all kinds of questions to do with corporations, about the monopolies on those patents, should we bring those vaccines to those countries or not? So there's a huge inequality issue. It is also a widening gap. Uh, uh, Tony Atkinson uh, did a lot of work on that, but also Thomas Piketty together with Tony Atkinson and, and other people uh, on this whole idea that, that the top 1% uh, and even the top 0.1% of societies uh, throughout the world have been getting richer and richer and richer. And even during the pandemic, the richest people have been getting hugely rich, much richer than the rest of society. So inequality is a big issue. Inequality in health, inequality in housing, inequality in access to education, and inequality in incomes and just general inequality in the opportunities to have a decent life. So, so that's the second big theme of today. And the third big theme of today after We've had a sign of relief that Biden is now uh, president, if I say this uh, on my own account. Before that, we had Trump in Hungary. We have uh, also uh, governments, and in may maybe even Poland, but, but I'll leave that aside, where uh, democracy and, and the quality of institutions, particularly uh, the legal system, but, but all the countervailing balances that are a, a part of normal societies, of liberal societies, are being attacked left, right, and center. Not just... Uh, uh, we thought maybe we think badly about a clown like Boris Johnson in the UK, but that's not, at least institutions are still being respected in England, whereas in many countries institutions are really uh, deliberately being dismantled. So it's, it's not, it's Russia, uh, China, uh, now Hong Kong, very sadly, uh, 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 but of course, uh, they had a good go at it in America. Uh, so here we are, the, the big three themes, the, the institutional collapse, are people voting? Uh, so the whole problem of democracy, uh, uh, that inequality, and and the environment. So these are the three things. And so I won't I won't take your um, uh, your main messages away. But I expect Rebecca will talk to us, and and, and I'll sh I will stop here on a number of of, of uh, things we can do. Uh, so not just politicians and people, but your focus will be more on businesses. So so in that sense, you have a. 
you have a, a healthy thing. Of course, businesses themselves, some of them have been having this business for B model where lots of multinational corporations are trying to kind of go on this bandwagon that they want to be good for society. We will talk undoubtedly later about uh, somebody who, take, who took the complete opposite view like Milton Friedman and said, oh, yeah, companies, they just have to make profits and the, the bottom, the, the, the EBIT is the main thing, the, the, earnings, the earnings before tax. And, and, no, and no goody doody do this. But you will make a case, uh, we hope, and then we will discuss that on why companies uh, are very important to, to tackle those three crises in society political institutional crisis, uh, inequality crisis, and an environmental crisis. So, with those words, and I, I might come back later with questions, because I have lots of questions. Uh, I, 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 I love to hear you. I've heard you before. Of course, on the, due to this lovely Zoom, you can hear all kinds of people all over the place. This is something that was not possible before. So I look uh, forward Rick, very before much. Before we to go that. to uh, Professor Henderson, I have a question for you. Yeah. Where do you stand on this? Because I know that Rebecca Henderson says yes, capitalism has its fault, faults (plural), but we need capitalism. We need its innovation, its drive, its competitiveness. How do you feel? Because we know that you were a member of the Socialist or maybe still are, member of the Dutch Socialist Party? I used to write lots of papers when I was very young uh, on, uh, on Marxism and on, on things like that. But I, I'm a strong believer in a strong capitalist society, but it, uh, but it should be regulated and it, and it, and it should be... be uh, well, well, let's give an example. The example people give is, of course, that these uh, development of vaccines incredibly quickly, in less than a year, that, that was a clear example of governments working together with, uh, with, with big corporations as big and then trying to get and now we have to kind of try to distribute it. It's a little bit what uh, other economists like uh, in England is Mariana Masuacato, and she has often of course been arguing for that big corp and, and she follows in the footsteps of uh, Stuart Holland who, who wrote, did a lot of those arguments in the 70s that, that uh, following the IRI, the, the, the big Italian kind of state firm, which taking, taking kind of uh, um, partnerships in, uh, in, in, in companies. But what we see, of course, is that governments are doing the opposite. So look after the pandemic, what is all being supported? The old uh, brown carbon intensive zombies, uh, and rather than investing in this new way for this new way of life, that we have to reinvent capitalism and we have to reinvent society. So, so I'm very much uh, uh, yeah, along the same line. And Julia, the, the has, uh, the has Rebecca be Henderson been able to convince you? Uh, well, yes, I think that yes. Um, we've been discussing your your book uh, during the lectures, and um, yeah, we really liked your ideas. But still, there are many questions uh, because the issue is so complex. Uh, so we still have a lot of questions question. to ask. Um, yeah. So that's my Mother Russia. Uh, yeah, I think someone uh, unmuted himself by oh. mistake. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let's continue. Well, we're not we're not that far along yet. So we will go have a seat, and uh, yeah. I'm very curious to hear Professor Henderson's talk. Tracy, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And Rick, I really appreciate uh, your kind words about my work. And Julia, I'm with you. There are lots and lots of questions here. So my plan is to give a very brief overview of the argument of the book, but then to leave lots of time for discussion after that. So let me try and summarize the book. I assert, as Rick suggested, that the world faces a number of massive public goods problems from environmental degradation, biodiversity and climate change to accelerating inequality and racial and ethnic exclusion and institutional degradation and in some cases institutional collapse. I think the first best solution to these three problems is the classic liberal solution that uh, Rick outlined. I think a free market is vital to a flourishing society, but I think it needs to be balanced by a democratically accountable, transparent, strong, capable government, and that both market and government in turn need to be balanced by strong civil society. 
That means an independent judiciary, a strong and independent media, and a voice for labor. So that is my solution, and it's a very classic solution. What is new in my work, I hope, is that I suggest that the private sector can play an important role in rebalancing our society, in reclaiming this lost balance. And that's a very unlikely idea. And sometimes people say to me, Rebecca, you've got to be kidding. Business saves the world, really? Um, so let me say again that I think the first best solution is first best. And that if I could choose, I would choose a massive global political and social movement that insists on regulating uh, problems like climate change, that builds strong safety nets for all, that enables education and health so that we minimize inequality and differences. But in many parts of the world, including both of the countries I'm from, the prospect of the government taking many of these actions seems remote. And the prospect of taking these kinds of action at a global level seems even more remote. So I turn to business as one of the most powerful and most trusted institutions on the planet to address these questions. It's not as unlikely as you would think, because I believe, and I hope I can persuade you, that solving these problems is squarely in the private sector's interest. That climate change is not going to be good for business, that accelerating inequality and the rage and anger that it engenders not only reduces the pool of highly trained workers, but also is leading directly to the kind of institutional problems we're encountering. And I venture to suggest that if we do not address these issues, we risk seeing a collapse to what is sometimes called extractive regimes. An extractive regime is one in which the rich and the powerful control both the economic and the political activity and essentially take all the rents for themselves, hence extraction. Uh, Russia right now is a classically extractive regime. The Chinese state appears to be moving more in this direction. We don't know, but that's what it looks like. And we're seeing in, um, in Western, in parts of Eastern Europe, a move towards this kind of crony capitalism and extraction. I think this move is even visible in the United States. It's not good for business. I read the data in this area, both in political science and development economics, as suggesting very strongly that societies grow and thrive when you have the combination of a genuinely free and fair market and a genuinely open democracy. Because it's only this balance of power that can set the rules of the game for the free market that lets everyone participate and everyone succeed through free and fair competition. And without this kind of regime, without this kind of holding, we will collapse to extraction. So, so that I think there's a business case for business to pay attention to these issues. It is of course a collective case. If somehow we could represent business by a single individual, I imagine that if I went to them and said, would you like me to solve climate change? And how about inequality? And wouldn't a bit of democracy be a good idea? My guess is that individual would say absolutely yes, that they would have read the same research and they'd say, yeah, I want to be part of a mixed liberal economy. That's the way that my businesses will grow most rapidly and I will have a strong um, workforce that's in, in, and, and great consumers that want to buy my stuff but it's a collective action problem. So my book can be read as a hypothesis as to how the collective action problem could be solved. I start with the idea that it is very important for business to think of its, set, of its primary duty and goal, not as maximizing profits or maximizing returns to investors, but as helping to build a strong and thriving society. I think business should understand it has an important responsibility to the institutions in which, it, in which it is embedded. After all, one of the quickest ways to maximize shareholder value is to lobby politicians to shape the rules in, the, in your own favor. But that can't have been what Milton Friedman had in mind. It's very unlikely that that increases aggregate prosperity or individual freedom. So I think the deepest normative commitments of capitalism require firms to take responsibility for the health of the institutions in which they're embedded, and at the very least, to stop actively destroying their health. 
So to me, to emit greenhouse gases without paying for it is an immoral act in the terms of capitalism because we have a massive mispricing in the market of an emissions in normal damage, but those of us who emit them uh, get to cause that damage without cost. So I think business should adopt this uh, a sense of purpose, a sense of commitment to the greater society. Now, I'm an engineer and an economist and adopting a sense of purpose will, you know, like nice words, Rebecca, what would that mean? Well, on the ground, it would mean actively looking for opportunities to create shared value, to find business models that both make money and address major social or environmental problems. In my book, I talk about a CEO called Eric Osmundson, who runs a company called Norsk Genvinning. Eric joined Norsk Genvinning, which is a garbage company, following a very successful career in private equity. That might not seem like a very conventional uh, career move, but Eric knew that if we could change the way we handle our garbage, we could reduce global emissions by hundreds of millions of tons. When he arrived at the firm, he found that the industry was deeply corrupt. Uh, firms were uh, discarding waste illegally, were mislabeling medical and hazardous waste and shipping it overseas. And the fines for violation were tiny and very rarely enforced. Eric could have quit, he thought about it. But he had a very strong belief that business could make a difference and he wanted to participate. And so he announced that Norsk Genvinning was not going to do anything illegal, that it was going to run clean and will raise its prices in order to do so. Half of his customers left the firm immediately. So did half of his senior team. <laughs> his competitors sued him for bringing the in industry into disrepute. But once he started to stand up, other people wanted to be a part of what he was creating. The employees who remained were thrilled to be working for a firm that was competing through innovation and trying to transform the industry and found all kinds of legal ways to cut costs. A significant fraction of his customers announced that they were willing to pay more. His investors were willing to back him because they thought in the long term, his transformation of the industry would greatly increase industry profits and give him a leading position. And last but not least, a few of his competitors decided to join him and to announce that they too would run clean. I won't tell you that what followed was easy or quick or cheap, but Norsk Genvinning is now one of the largest recycling companies in Scandinavia one of the most desirable employees in Norway and is making a significant difference against the waste problem. This is how I see purpose-driven businesses making a difference. Discovering a business model that can both solve public, pub public problems and make money. In the Norsk Genvinning case, he, uh, by moving the industry towards recycling and thinking of waste as a source of raw materials rather than as something you throw into a hole in the ground, he was able to develop an industry leading position based on high technology and economy of scale. He was able to persuade his employees that he was authentically purpose driven, motivating them in ways that significantly both increased his innovation and reduced his costs. He was able to persuade his competitors to join him in doing the right thing, making paying attention to these issues pre-competitive so that no one was at a disadvantage, uh, promising not to dispose of waste illegally. And last, but and two more things, he worked with his investors and we could talk a great deal about the need to rewire finance, which in my mind is absolutely essential if we're to solve the problems we face, but he was able to persuade his steps to reimagining capitalism, create shared value, cooperate with your competitors, uh, rewire, rewire finance, and work with government to rebuild the kind of balance between public and private sectors we need. Last but not least, we do this 
because our responsibility is to the broader society, not only to our investors, but also to the long-term well-being of the institutions that keep us prosperous and free. So that's my book in 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, lots and lots of questions uh, about it, and I, I very much look forward to, to hearing from you. Excuse me. Thank you, Rebecca. Looking forward to our conversation and also to questions from our audience in the Zoom. But first, I would like to give the floor to Julia. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Rebecca, for, for the whole introduction. And um, yeah, I would like to go back to Tracy's question, whether you, you have convinced me. And I think that if we can reimagine capitalism, then it will definitely solve our pro problems. But the question is whether, whether we are able to reimagine it. And here comes my first question to you, whether it is realistic that any business can be both purpose-driven and profitable. Uh, we already mentioned today Milton Friedman, who would say it's all about the profit. So what do you think is the ultimate driver? Is it purpose or is it profit? <laughs> the ultimate driver is always profits in the sense that if as a company, I don't give my investors decent returns, they're liable to fire me. So profits are always important. But that doesn't mean they have to be the goal of the enterprise. We all need to breathe to live, but that doesn't mean that breathing is our goal. You can have a firm that has broader goals than simply making money, and it can be very profitable. At HBS, we have more than 300 case examples of firms that are solving environmental or social problems and making a great deal of money, sometimes by something as simple as using high road employment systems, deciding to pay the people that work for them a living wage, treating them with dignity and respect, and redesigning work so that they can be genuinely empowered to make decisions and innovate in the work they, they do. And this is not just a matter for people at the high end of the income distribution. My colleague Zainib Tan at MIT has shown, I think very convincingly, that you can do this with uh, retail outlets, with some of the least skilled people in the world, that if you redesign work and you treat them with dignity and respect, give people the training they need, that you can generate innovation and productivity and creativity that more than pays for giving everybody a decent wage and reasonable benefits. And um, so what is the goal of the firm? Is it to create great jobs and strengthen the community or to give a decent return to investors? Well, both, but you can definitely survive while thinking about more than making money. In fact, that's what most great firms have done. They've, they've been created to introduce some fantastic products or really make a difference. That, that's the heritage of the private sector. I think we just need to reclaim it. Um, yeah, but uh, this, this would also require uh, every firm to have appropriate purpose, right? And we still have a lot of people who deny climate change. So can we make sure that the purpose of, of the firm is sustainable? Oh, Julia, <laughs> fabulous, fabulous question. <laughs> I am not suggesting that we will solve our problems by every firm becoming purpose-driven because it isn't going to happen. You are exactly right. The vision that I have in mind is that maybe 20 to 25% of the largest firms and the most entrepreneurial firms become purpose-driven. And as they innovate, as they move, they show other firms that there's money to be made. So take Elon Musk as the most obvious example, an incredibly purpose-driven, if complicated, person. He has probably accelerated the introduction of electric vehicles by five years. He was purpose-driven, he took the risk, he took the chances to explore this new way of producing cars, and everyone else has been effectively forced to follow him. So I see these firms as catalysts in their own industry and in their own region. And um, as you know, because you've been discussing my book, I don't think we will solve these problems until and unless all investors insist that firms do and or governments do. 
because there's always going to be firms that say, I'll pay people the bottom of the pay scale and I don't care about climate change, it's cheap to burn coal. And so ultimately we're going to need institutions that coerce them. And that could be investors, we can talk more about that, but it could also, and most obviously be governments. So another part of what I'm hoping here, and let me be clear, this is hope I'm talking about. I'm not like, this is a done deal, this is definitely going to happen. I, I think this could happen that as more and more purpose-driven firms emerge and make progress, they begin to change both the political and the uh, social climate. They make it feasible that we could address these problems without damaging the economy, that they accelerate the possibility of government action. Okay. May I uh, uh, bring in a question, I believe from one of your fellow students because I see her on the screen Chandra Laka Tanabalan. Uh, her question is, pursuing purpose is sometimes argued to be a privilege for companies in developed countries, for companies in developed countries. Some argue that companies in developing countries can't afford to do that because doing that would mean that they can't compete with companies from developed economies. What are your thoughts on this dichotomy? I, I think, I don't think that's true. Uh, my whole belief and the focus of my research is that you can be purpose-driven and be more productive and more innovative and more creative than conventional firms. And I think the kinds of business models that I'm focusing on, where you can design a business model that is less environmentally costly or that creates better jobs and still make money, those business models are absolutely available in the developing world. So if you think about the opportunities in agriculture, where um, there's an enormous amount of work to be done, both in improving uh, uh, wages and working conditions in the supply chain and in reducing carbon emissions, if there are business models that allow you to do that at, at scale and to make money, those are going to be absolutely available in the developing world. And many companies in the developing world are much less stuck in their ways, much more aware of the way the world is changing, much more entrepreneurial and open. They're ideally positioned to address some of these problems. Um, so one of the things you say in your book um, is that we need sustainability metrics. And you know that the development of accounting rules took around 100 years, yet still every year there are frauds. Uh, so I wonder how can we develop effective sustainability metrics fast enough because we do not have 100 years, right? Because the urgency is so strong. We know we need metrics, that without metrics, a lot of this is greenwashing. I could turn to my investors and say, I'm going to do a purpose-driven model and it's going to work out fine, but how will my investor know if I cannot measure it? How can investors decide to move their investments into more sustainable firms if there are no material, replicable, auditable metrics? How could investors who decide, um, and this is increasingly true of the large asset owners, that climate change is a systemic risk to the viability of the entire financial system, how can they push the companies in their portfolio to reduce the carbon emissions and to plan to transition to fossil fuels without metrics? So we really, really need metrics. Now, Julie, you've gone right for the jugular. Took financial metrics 100 years. Why should this be faster? Because the world is burning. I had the great pleasure of uh, being in a meeting where I heard from the CEOs of two of the world's largest accounting companies. As you may know, the, the big four, the so-called big four have come together with a number of other major financial institutions, laying out what might be the beginning of a standardized ESG set that can be used both by investors and by firms. And what was exciting about that meeting was the sense of urgency and commitment that everyone in that room bought, bought to uh, making progress on ESG metrics. There are literally thousands of people working on this problem and millions of dollars chasing an answer. I'm, uh, I was 20 years a professor at MIT. I think when humans decide to solve problems, they absolutely can be solved. And I think we'll solve this one amazingly quickly. May I? Yes, of I course. have a question from uh, Kate Velixar, who is herself from the Republic of Moldova. She wants to know from Professor Henderson what you think will be a suitable and sustainable solution 
for countries where crony capitalism is rampant, like in Eastern European countries? So I am not an expert in crony capitalism. I'm an economist and an engineer, not a political scientist. Um, I am hopeful that in these kinds of countries, the business sector might be part of the solution. Uh, when you look at the history of Chile or South Africa, you see moments when the private sector stepped up and said, no, we need an open democratic regime in which everyone is included. I tell stories in my books about, in, in my book, about uh, Denmark in the 19th century, which was not crony capitalism, but wasn't that great. Um, or Germany in the 40s and Mauritius in the 60s, moments when business people acting together formally committed themselves to clean elections, to a reduction in corruption, to the recognition of the rights of labor. Now, you're going to ask how that happened. In the examples I know about, it happened because the situation got very, very bad. Um, so when the society is at the edge of breaking, there have been moments when the private sector has stepped up. I'm not recommending that. Of course, if there are ways to build political and social movements such that ordinary people can join together and work with politicians and with the private sector to change the regime, that's ideal. But um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, why did the wall fall? I'm not an expert on that, but surely we can learn something from these, uh, from these very significant social shifts. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, another thing that I would like to talk with you about um, is the Palm Oil case that you cover in your book. And it shows that uh, self-regulation and cooperation across firms can actually be ineffective. So uh, I wonder, will businesses really be able to work together to solve sustainability problems? <laughs> Five years ago, Julia, I would have answered yes. I was working with groups of firms in the textile and apparel business and in the food business, and they had formed these very impressive collaborations. At one time, nearly 70% of globally traded palm oil was covered by sustainability agreements. And we really thought that the, the collective buying power of these big Western firms could clean up supply chains across the world. But you should know when I met with one of the most well-known historians of self-regulation and I told him I thought these kinds of cooperative agreements could change the world, he looked at me and he giggled. He said, oh, come on, Rebecca. Do you know how many of those arrangements are just about raising prices and keeping out entrance? And it's super hard to maintain, uh, to maintain collaboration. So I, since uh, in the five years since, I have seen those kinds of pressures at work. I think collaborative arrangements can have a very important role to play. They highlight the metrics that need to be made, the, measure, the things that need to be measured if we're going to make sure every firm is meeting its commitments. A lot of firms make a public commitment to doing the right thing and then find that the collaboration isn't working. And that creates immense appetite for bringing in government regulation or bringing in finance, banks and investors to enforce the collaboration. So we see, for example, in the mining and minerals industry, um, the Ecuador principles, which says we will not fund you if you do not meet basic human rights principles. That's an example of the capital markets enforcing collaboration. I think that's where we're going. Initial collaboration to work out what it is we need to do and why there's a business case for doing it. And then turning to either the capital markets or local governments to enforce the rules that will lock that in place. I nearly fell off my chair the first time I heard a major executive in the textile industry say, I guess we just have to support the government in enforcing their labor laws. But that is something that they have done. And we now have some very nice research showing that the public sector can work in concert with local governments to enforce local laws to improve everyone's well-being. Rick, are you, uh, do you follow uh, Rebecca in this uh, uh, faith in collaboration? Well, uh, I would like to ask you, in a way, in, from Europe, we look at it very strange because we think always think of stakeholder capitalism is very normal. 
but of course you go much further, I suppose, because like in Germany, for example, employees sit on the board of companies. We think in the Netherlands that uh, everybody talks with each other and uh, the employees, the customers, the government, and they try to get all get things together. So, so, so maybe how much of your story is directed to Amer American ears rather than to European ears. Uh, and I mean, not including the UK, of course, but, but, but from a continental yeah. European perspective. Uh, and and used to mean, in the old days, we had this thing called Michel Albert, where this book, uh, Capitalism Contra Capitalism, and which is all about the Rhinelandic model. But I think you go much further than that because you say, no, we need people like Bill Gates. We need people like Elon Musk. We need these kind of these, these, these uh, technical innovation guys. We need to kind of, it goes much further than stakeholder capitalism, I believe. But, but that's a question. I talked to a friend once about my book and he looked at me and he said, Rebecca, you called this reimagining capitalism, but really it should be called could we please go back to US capitalism as it was in the 50s and 60s, except without the racism and the misogyny? Could we please go back or could we please go to Germany or Japan in its glory days when it was stakeholder, you know, stakeholder oriented and growing so fast? Um, so I think you're exactly right. Much of elements of what I'm talking about have absolutely been real in uh, both in uh, America post World War II, but also most noticeably in Europe. I think, you know, if we could take the whole world and turn it into the Netherlands, I think that would be amazing. <laughs> I really do. Amazing in a good but, way, Rebecca? Or, uh... In a good way. But you're Dutch, so, or not in your case, Tracy, but most people listening to me are Dutch. I'm sure you're aware of the issues and problems and challenges. It's always going to be a matter of balancing the free market and the state. And if I had to point to a weakness in some parts of Europe, it might be that the free market is not as innovative and competitive and dynamic as it is in some other parts of the world. And mm -hmm. You know, if we look, for example, at France and ask perhaps the labor market is a little bit too rigid and too many young people feel shut out of jobs and opportunity, um, even as French labor law is developed with the best of intentions. So I think what I'm really pointing to is the need to keep a dynamic balance between these elements of state, market and civil society. Not one perfect solution, uh, not one way to do it and something that will always have to be fought for. So I have of, a, a okay. oh, sorry, so, go so ahead. Just one, one of the things I would have expected you to write a little bit more about, but, but I think it's maybe in your book, is this whole idea of uh, tipping points. Because you, you, you almost said as only a quarter of firms could possibly do it, uh, because there will always be bad firms. And so so in, in a sense, there's all issue what economists call strategic complementarities. So the idea is that uh, in order to develop new technology, for example, batteries, to make them better, to really get good energy, we need to have a lot of demand. We need to sell a lot of the stuff, but that's really cheap. But, but to get a lot of demand, you need to have a lot of technology. So you're in a kind of a, a, a game of chicken situation that they're all waiting for each other. So, so who's going to overcome this game of chicken problem? Is it the government? Or is it business itself? But just talking is not going to do the job, is it? It's both. And my hope is purpose-driven firms can be exactly the kind of firms that start that positive flywheel going. I really like Mariana Mazzucato's work and her focus on the way government has done that in many important industries. I helped publish a book called Accelerating Innovation in Energy, Lessons from Other Sectors. And we looked at what had driven tipping points in a whole range of industries and found in most of them it was government action and particularly the creation of demand yeah. and funding of long-term R&D. But do we have a formula for how that happens or how it needs to happen now? I, I don't think we do. It's an area I think would really benefit from further research. And there's also, and then I'll stop, there's also the whole idea of socialization of preferences. So it's not just the tipping points of firms, but also by if more people become green, then I have two reactions. If, if Tracy becomes green, I could either say, oh, well, no need for me to be green. She's already been green. Or it could be that Tracy is green, then more and more people say, oh, I'll become green as well. And, and that can create other kind of flywheel effects like the Greta Grunberg oh. effect and others. Mm -hmm. Rick, Rick I, I wish we could go out for dinner tonight and talk about this because I'm completely with you. I think there's a concatenation of change factors that will be complementary to each other. 
And the question is, how do we get things moving? I tried to write a chapter for the book, which was looking backwards, which said, here's how it happened. You know, here's, here are the mutually reinforcing changes that happened. Here's how we built a just and sustainable society. I think it's another book. <laughs> I do not know enough about how these forces interact with each other or what will move first, but that's absolutely how I'm thinking of it. I think your description is really, really excellent. When you said, if only all the world could be the Netherlands, Rebecca, the first thing I had to think of is, well, hmm, I don't know if we have actually done as good a job of COVID response as I think many Dutch people would have expected from our government, speaking as a sort of quasi Dutch person. And that refers to a question here by uh, Jeff Derricks. He says, do you really believe that the urgency of the problems leads by definition to a correct response? COVID-19 was and is very urgent, yet governments did not respond correctly. Why would firms respond better? Two things. I'm not saying that firms are better than government. My first best solution is government action. We need strong regulation in the case of climate. We need investment in health and education and redistribution and active inclusion to address problems of inequality. These are problems for the state. My fear is that in many parts of the world, the state is not going to step up in the way it should. And in fact, I think COVID has in this way had a terrible silver lining which is many business people used to think that, well, particularly where I live, that government was just a nuisance, that regulation was always bad, that we should drown government in the bathtub. And what COVID has made clear, even as so many governments have stumbled, is that we need good, capable government. I view the stumbles of many governments as, alas, the result of years of running down government, of worship of the market as the only really important institution instead of one amongst many. And so in a way, it's not fair. We look at government response. This is certainly in the case in the US and say, well, that was a mess. But it's partly because we've been systematically defunding and denigrating government. So I absolutely think the government has the most important role to play. The reason I turn to business is I think business can be helpful. Business can be a catalyst. And indeed, business in the early days of COVID has been helpful. Um, we talked about the development of the vaccine. I mean, how amazing is that? It took less than a year. No vaccine has been developed in that kind at that kind of pace. And I spent I sat for more than 10 years on a major pharmaceutical board. I have many friends in the industry, and I can tell you that that effort was shot through with purpose. Yes, there were, was a profit motive, but mostly people worked all the time, all the time and formed relationships between their allies and competitors that had never been formed before because they thought they should, because they wanted to help be part of the problem. So, um, Definitely firms can't solve all the problems, but I think they can be very helpful. Um, and do you, do you think that the world's response to COVID-19 uh, shows that we are capable of cooperating at the global level? Because, you know, uh, climate change could be something, uh, sort of a future uh, pandemic, global pandemic. So uh, looking at how countries uh, cooperate, do you think that this is possible? I think it's definitely possible. I think it has a horrible habit of being heartbreakingly slow. Uh, so I'm sure we'll eventually take action against climate change. I wish it would be next year. You know, 3% <laughs> of GDP, pick your number, but a relatively minimal investment now to head off hundreds, if not thousands of years of human suffering and millions of deaths. Um, I think it is possible. I think COVID might be a template, but as we see right now, most of the vaccine is still going to the developed world. But there are plans in place for disseminating production of the vaccine. Um, there is a major public-private coalition trying to make sure that everyone gets access. So can we do it? I think we can. It's possible, for sure. And, and to do it, um, many people say that we would need to overcome this tendency of short-termism. 
uh, and I wonder how can we do it because short-term orientation is actually root, uh, is something that is rooted in our evolutionary history. So, oh. so can we overcome this? <laughs> <laughs> to me, the history of the human race is the history of human attempts to move away from the fact that part of us is fundamentally selfish and part of us is fundamentally short-term oriented. I know that every day I should exercise and eat healthy food. And I'm afraid there are days when I eat chocolate in front of the television. You know, it's just, uh, and I know that um, I should work together with my family and my firm. But I think the good news is humans have a history of developing institutions to help us focus on the long term. I interpret the great faith traditions, for example, and I mean no disrespect to any of the traditions, and surely they're much, they say much more than this. But one of the things I think all the great traditions say is it is fundamentally unskillful to focus only on yourself and only on the current moment. That the way to a rich and healthy life and community is to think about the longer term and to think about the people around you. Families do that too. Even firms do that. We talk about firms as being shot, you know, all about profits on the bottom line, but within a firm, there is often a commitment to the long term. So um, humans can definitely do it. Now, we need to change the metrics, see earlier, but um, I think with the right metrics and with the right uh, regulations, we can certainly focus on the long term. Thank you. Um, so uh, I wonder uh, whether you think that this whole transition that is so complex, um, what want, want it trigger some winners and losers and what would you, uh, be your message to to those companies that will not be able to make the transition i spent the first 20 years of my life studying innovation not not of my life sorry that would be audacious the first 20 years of my career studying innovation i was the eastman kodak professor of management at mit and I worked with firms like Kodak. I worked with Kodak. I worked with Nokia, trying to persuade them to respond to Apple. I worked with Motorola, a firm perhaps many of you have never heard of, but in its time this was one of the- This is like a dangerous track record, Rebecca. Yeah, no. I... <laughs> All I'm saying is I know what happens to firms who refuse to change. I, I know that firms deny the future say there's no money to be made, claim they're too busy. I know exactly what happens to them. And that is exactly what happen, will happen to firms who do not see where the world needs to go. We have um, an increasingly strong sense among the general public, among consumers, among employees, that we need to build a just and sustainable capitalism. And those firms that don't begin to move in this direction will be left behind. But Julia, can I throw the question back to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will try to answer. <laughs> what I was not expecting this. <laughs> uh, well, but what do you think will ultimately get us going? When we look back 20 years from now and say we did it, what will have made the difference? Um, yeah, what I think is that all of the changes that needs to happen, like whether, you know, in government, whether uh, in, in companies um, or, or some uh, groups or whatever, uh, the choices are made by individuals. So what I think is that we really need to raise awareness and, and we really need some kind of you know, great leaders who, who, will, who will be able to, for instance, help us overcome this short termism and so on. So, so yeah, I think, I think maybe something like this, but this is a really hard question. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't have a I'm ready sure answer. My... If I would, then I would definitely also write a book. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies for putting you on the spot. Um, in, in front of so many people, but you gave a fantastic answer as I, as I knew you would. Um, I wonder if you're right. I wonder about the role of individual transformation in moving us in the direction we need to go. 
Um, as an engineer and an economist, it's not something I'm equipped to talk about. But I have discovered that so many of the leaders of this change at every level in organizations are personally committed to it in a very deep way and really have a very different view of what's important and what they're doing with their lives. So I, I'm sure that's a huge element of the change that we have to see. Yeah, yeah. And I think so also that uh, like looking at some, uh, you know, psychological uh, knowledge that um, people need to experience some kind of uh, consequences of climate change. Uh, because if we experience, then we actually feel that we are threatened and we are motivated to, to act. So I'm afraid that uh, we need to wait some time till, we'll, till will this uh, actually happen. Or maybe the pandemic will be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, awakened moment. So yeah, I, I hope for that at least. It, it's, it's a puzzle, right? A, th a third of Bangladesh was underwater last summer. Most of Australia burned. California lost 4 million acres. Houston saw 300 year floods in five years. So we're already seeing the effects, but well, this is my earlier work. People will deny and deny and deny <laughs> until it hits them over the head, um, alas. Yeah, because for you know, for uh, for instance, when I was in in Poland and all the fire was happening, then uh, you know, obviously I, I felt sorry, and I, maybe I felt sorry more than <laughs> some other people. But still, you know, we were in our houses, safe, uh, watching the television. So, yeah. so yeah, I think it will it will take some time. It will take some time. So do we have any questions? We have from... lots of okay. questions, but I know you still have some too, Julia, so we're not done yet. Um, I have an interesting question from uh, Maartje Vraaie, who works at a big bank here in the Netherlands at the Rabobank. Uh, she says, you talked about the top 25 as purpose-driven companies. As one of the big banks in the Netherlands, we focus on those front runners, but also the group behind them. Should we actually mostly focus on the front runners to achieve that 25%? What would you, what would your, uh, in this case, unpaid advice for the Rabobank be? <laughs> I do not know. My guess is that focusing on the front runners is really important. If it were me. Psychologically? Uh, for psychological reasons? No, um, they have more time and space. They're more likely to move. And when they move, they'll have more of an impact. But as my second group, Instead of the next tier, I would focus, depending on the industry, on entrepreneurial firms, on fringe firms, because I think I know that large firms really only change when they see small firms making money in ways they don't understand and poaching their customers. And so I would be really trying to encourage entrepreneurs who are introducing these new business models and new ways of working, in addition to supporting the large firms in moving but I'm not we, at all sure I'm right. If we look at the Norwegian example that you gave, Rebecca, um, what was it that inspired this one leader of the garbage business to turn the model all around? What, what went before? Um, very courageous, I must say. It, it was very courageous. He'd be the first to say, oh, no, it was no big deal. It was my team. But I happen to know his children had to get police protection because the other firms in the industry were so angry about what he was doing and saying. So it did take a lot of courage. He would say it was nothing special, that it was obvious this needs to be done. And I have had the great privilege and pleasure of meeting thousands of business people who are committed to doing the right thing. I think when we let ourselves stop, when we let ourselves pause, when we let ourselves breathe, we can see that things are really going in a terrible direction. I believe our civilization is at risk in, in a deep way. And I think there's a sense of urgency, certainly the students that come to do the Harvard MBA now, uh, many, many of them want to take these kinds of risks and 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 be this kind of leader and, and this kind of follower. Because the other thing Eric would have said is I would have got nowhere without the people in the organization. And when you turn to a firm and you say, it's not just about the money, here's what we could do for our customers and our children and our future, um, people light up. 
they, it's so exciting as a different way to spend your life. There was a review of your book in the newspaper that I also write for myself, NRC Homeless Blogs, and um, there were a couple of interesting remarks in there. And one of them was, if it's so profitable to do the right thing, why haven't businesses been doing that all along? What has changed? Big, well, I think it's always been profitable to run high road firms, but it is emotionally expensive and it requires a long term commitment to doing the right thing. If you are trying, it's much more comfortable to manage people as things and to manage for the current quarter. So there's a threshold energy to adopt a new way of working. Once adopted, I think we have a great deal of evidence that, um, that it is at least as good as conventional ways of, of, of doing things. I mean, a lot of my uh, scholarly academic research is exactly about this question, Tracy, as you may know. Uh, why is it, if there's a different way to do things, why isn't everyone running there? And so I focus on things like path dependency, which is you have to be consistent. I focus on um, things like worse before better. You have to be willing to make investments now for gains later. I focus on things like vision. You have to be able to see a broader picture and to think more widely. Most organizations are not run at optimum, uh, the optimum way. You know, my, my first scholarly paper ever was called Underinvestment and Incompetence in the Face of Radical Change. And in that paper, I suggested that there were real changes that would be profitable that firms could not see and would not act on. And the letter I got back from the economic journal said, dear Rebecca, you have written a paper about how the moon is made of green cheese. And economists have written too little about cheesy planetoids. But this is the most interesting paper any of the referees have read this year. Would you please revise it and send it back to us? And I think what's been happening in economics is an increasing recognition that inertia is real that it is hard to change very large complex systems and risky to do so. And so of course change is difficult, but that does not mean it's unprofitable. Um, looking at the watch, uh, I see that we unfortunately have not so much time uh, anymore. And I have two very important questions uh, for you that I would really like to ask. So, so the first one is, what do you think can our generation do to speed up the changes and achieve a sustainable world in our lifetime? How That's just you? one of the questions, right? <laughs> I'm 22. Okay. In, in, in a minute, make trouble. <laughs> Firms change when their consumers and their employees and their investors insist that they do. One of the things that still hasn't happened is most people are not shifting their buying behaviors because of their values. Employees are starting to move. So in the firms you join, make trouble politely, appropriately, but raise the tough questions. I have a friend who's a CEO who five years ago called me and said, Rebecca, you know, I think this sustainability stuff is bullshit. And I said, Fred, not his real name. Yeah, Fred, I, I know that. He said, well, everyone I'm trying to hire thinks it's important. W would you come and talk to us about it and tell us like maybe we can do something? I mean, now his firm is one of the most purpose-driven firms I know, but it's because his employees insisted that he think about new ways of running things. So um, make trouble and make political trouble too. We really do need new rules as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does it work? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. On one of your interviews, I, I also heard that you said uh, that one of the most important thing is that is that everyone uh, goes uh, voting. And I've heard that, you know, it really touched me because because I'm from Poland and we have quite some issues and I feel that young people are not so interested in politics. So, so w what do you think? How important is being up to date and being interested in, in politics? Incredibly important because it's on the ground organizing that will make the difference. But you can't do that just by telling people to vote. 
you do that by having dinners with friends and talking about what's wrong with the world and how things ought to change. And you do that by doing that within your neighborhood, within your friend groups, where you work, building coalitions that can really push for change. Um, here in the US, we've seen a significant uptick in young people voting because they've really started to understand how fragile the democracy is and how important a role government plays. Um, we got that because things got really quite bad. I <laughs> hope they're not that bad in Poland, but that's also something that will really support young people in getting politically engaged. It is so important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I have still this one question, but uh, we still have some time. So Keep it for last. It's <laughs> yes, an important yes, question. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I had a question on my own, uh, uh, on my own nickel. Um, one of the cases that you mentioned in the book as, a, as an interesting case is uh, Unilever and palm oil. But many people see Unilever's plantations in Africa as an example of an extractive, exploitative economy, old style capitalism. What is it about Unilever and palm oil that makes you think otherwise? Oh, I think otherwise about Unilever as a whole. I think for a profit driven firm, they are amazingly aware of the environmental and social consequences of their work but they are a profit-driven firm. And we live in a world where the pursuit of profit often leads to extraction. Now, I don't know the details about the African plantation. I can tell you that their tea business is significantly more sustainable than it was 10 years ago, that they pay more to employees in their supply chain and work hard on ensuring the long-term viability of the plantations. Is that exploitative? I think that's a broader question about values um, and about ownership. If it were me, I would distribute ownership of the big corporations much more widely so that everyone, including the people who work for them, has, has ownership. I think that would be immensely helpful. But I'm comparing Unilever to many other companies in their industry, not to some, maybe we could structure things very significantly differently. Um, so, so that's why I write about Unilever as I do. Don't you, think, don't, don't you feel it's a bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with some of these companies? So there's a lot of the, 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 the CEO is allowed to be uh, tell a nice green story and then they're extracting like hell, the palm palm oil. Even Shell is doing it. Shell is kind of true pricing. They put in a high price for carbon uh, in all their operations. And yet nobody would argue that Shell is really a very environmentally conscious firm or indeed an ethical firm, as the recent court case has shown about their misbehavior in the Niger Delta. So this is why I think metrics are so important, mm. that being able to give speeches about how well I treat the people in my supply chain is nothing compared to consistent metrics about do you pay a living wage, um, are there incidences of abuse, how are your diversity statistics? We need good measures. Um, but, but my theory is as follows, that all these CEOs are very well willing, but as soon as they retire, they become green and they go and they join the United Nations or they become a, uh, some, some kind of green international agency and they do everything. We've got about three or four of them in the Netherlands and they are they were excellent businessmen looking very carefully after their profits. The minute they retire, the saving is true for politicians. We had some very market-oriented politicians. And the minute they retire, they become suddenly green and they see the light. And how come they never did it when they were in charge of the firm or when they were in charge of the country? Because the structures are so constraining. This is why we have to change the way the capital markets allocate capital and track results. And we have to change the regulations and the rules. The best way to make companies pay attention to their workforce is to force them to to set a minimum wage, to say there's a minimum package of benefits. That has to be where we're striving to get to. My focus on business is as a potential catalyst in helping drive these kinds of systemic changes. I'm not saying they're there or it's easy or that business is all we need, God forbid, no way. Or even that I'm optimistic in the sense that, oh, this purpose-driven movement is going to make a difference. But I do think that it is important that the big four accounting firms are saying to all their clients, you have to move to ESG. 
I do think it's important that 30% of the world's capital is now claiming it really cares about climate change and is pushing the firms in its portfolio to do something on the ground. These are not going to solve the problems we face, but I do believe they may be helpful. So I'm completely with you that we need to have these catalysts, that these big innovators. And then the problem, for example, I know a little bit of a firm called Tomahawk just outside Oxford, and they can make small fusion and they're almost, they're almost there, almost it's 10 years or so. And then, and then once you've solved the, you solved the whole problem really, but then to invest in it for an investment fund is just not worth it. So, so they get big billionaires, but they should also get governments, the G7 or the G20, they should get together and be really going to invest in these really risky uh, game changers, whether it's electrical vehicles, whether it's fusion energy, or whether it's indeed vaccines for the pandemic. So in that sense, people like uh, Bill Gates but, uh, should be followed his advice and then government should really get their act together. Because if you leave the market alone, it's just... It won't do it. Now, this was the subject of my first book, Rick, um, Accelerating Innovation in Energy. Um, and I completely agree with you that we need very large scale investment in R&D, both development and deployment. Um, but we have political problems. <laughs> so we have to go through politics. And, and so then we need to, you know, and so it all becomes <laughs> circular. <laughs> but of course you're correct. dollar like minimum wage industry. in the US, huh? I'm sorry. And still no $15 minimum wage in the US. It was thrown We're getting out. closer, but. <laughs> well, um, we only have a few minutes left. I would like to do the following. Ask Rick if, uh, Rick if he has a couple uh, uh, final observations. Julie has a burning last question. And then I'll close off with just a couple closing remarks. Rick, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a wonderful uh, discussion and debate. And I particularly thank uh, Julia. Uh, I want to end saying that asking all young people to read your book and to read two or three other books, maybe also uh, uh, Maria, uh, Maria's book uh, and also Bill Gates's book. And because a lot of the action has to come both on the political front and when you start running companies, go and take courses with Rebecca. But it, it really is, it's, it's an appeal to, for us to help change society. And, and that's also how I read your book. So I, I, you come refreshed from it back. You say, oh, right, we need to get those flywheel actions, flywheels into action. And that's what it's all about. So thank you very much, Rebecca. It's, it's, it's been a lovely hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, so my last question. Um, yeah, I would like, sadly, to say that people my age are afraid that it is our generation who will face the consequences of climate change. And we are angry that the responsibility to fix this is on us. So I wonder, when you reimagine capitalism, do you imagine that businesses will change before it is too late? Oh, Julia. I think it is possible they will. I fear it will all happen too late. I wake at 4 a.m. so afraid for our son, for all the young people in the future. But then I get up and say, well, let's do the best we can. I will do what I can right here, right now. And that's, I think, all that any of us can do. And that's why we invited you to join us here this evening. So to me, the honor of thanking our guest of honor, Professor Rebecca Henderson, to our moderators, Rick van der Ploeg and Julia Schubert, and to our sponsors and partners, Amsterdam Business School and Limes International. To our audience, I would like to say we did start 15 minutes earlier because of the curfew. If you hadn't uh, uh, noticed that, then don't worry. The video will be on our website, uh, wwwjohn adamsnl very soon. And I would like to mention that on uh, March 16th, we have our next event, sadly still also online, but nevertheless titillating. Joining us will be Arun Chowdhury. He was a videographer with Obama and a campaign advisor to Bernie Sanders. And he has also been brought in as a consultant for the Dutch Labour Party for the elections here on the 17th. So that's why we're talking to him on the 16th, so that you will know when you go to vote on the 17th, what influence America has had on the Dutch elections. It's been a joy. Uh, 
I hope we'll all see you again on the 16th. Thank you very much to our audience. I'm sorry we didn't have time for all the Zoom questions, but perhaps we can save the chat and make sure that we send them on to uh, Rebecca. And I think last of all, a great word of thanks and applause to Rebecca Henderson. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. And Julia, thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very much. much. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rebecca, and everyone who joined us today. <laughs>